Good. Let's continue. Um, in doing hypothesis testing now, essentially, uh, is you know we applying the same concepts that we use for the confidence intervals to hypothesis testing. All we're doing now is basically changing the steps. All right. So we use the same situations as discussed before, standard deviation is known versus they are unknown. If they are unknown, they are assumed equal, and so forth. And so we have three possible statements for our hypotheses. One is that um, the mean of population one is greater than or equal to the mean of population two. And then in our alternate hypothesis, we are hypothesizing that the mean of population one is less than population two, all right? Now, we can sort of rearrange this as a difference. So if we brought mu two over to this side, it would be mu one minus mu two is greater than zero, which is where we get that here. <clears throat> and we repeat that the same thing for the bottom. If I brought um, mu two over to the left, then it becomes negative mu two, uh, which is less than zero. So I think we could appreciate that. In this case, this is a lower tail test because uh, in our alternate hypothesis, we are interested in the difference between the means being less than zero. Look at the arrow, it's pointing to the left, and so this, let's see, arrow, or the uh, inequality is pointing to the left, which means it's a left tail or lower tail test, and then on this side, it is a right tail test. If, however, we have in uh, HO, the means are equal versus they're not equal, then that's simply a two tail test, all right? When sigma 1 and sigma 2 are known, we use the, a test statistic that involves z. And you can see it looks like this. And that's, if you, if you remember our basic uh, formula for a test statistic, is usually the point estimate minus the population parameter divided by the standard error. They all have that same basic form. So we don't even need to get worried about this. So generic uh, thing is that we actually, Z or T actually measures for us. Z is actually measuring the sampling error. So you, if you recall from the single sample uh, cases, we took X bar, point estimate, minus the mean, divided by the standard deviation over the square root of N. But really, this was your sampling error Sampling error divided by the standard error. And essentially what it represents is the sampling error measured in standard deviations. Okay, So this is the standard deviation of the sample statistic X bar. That difference between those two is the sampling error. And we want to know how many standard deviations that represents. And you may recall I've said in the past that the bigger the value of z or t is, the bigger the sampling error. Or the bigger the sampling error, the bigger the value of z or t, the more extreme that sample. All right? So when we now go to this uh, formula, you will see that x bar 1 minus x bar 2 is the standard error. I know the standard error, the point estimate minus the population parameter and that gives us our sampling error so the difference between these two terms right here is your sampling error and this is your standard error and so we get z so if you understand these things at a conceptual level it is really not too difficult to continue the steps are pretty much the same steps that i gave i've given you before um, where we specify the parameters of interest formulate the hypothesis once we know the significance of the test that we want to use construct a rejection region and, this, uh, and develop the rules for rejecting the null hypothesis, gather the data, compute the test statistics, and reach a decision and a conclusion. All right? Now, in the case where sigma 1 and sigma 2 are unknown, it, although it says large samples, but the samples don't have to be large. If the samples are large or small, we could use the T distribution. So our estimate for the standard error is SP, into the square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. And of course, this is our sampling error in the numerator. Degrees of freedom, n1 plus n2 minus 2. In case you're wondering, how did we get that? 
Well, we got that by taking n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1 would give us n1 plus n2 minus 2. Okay? And here's how we calculate the pool sample standard deviation. When the samples are small, we actually could do the same thing right here. But we are not actually doing this case because in, in this case we would have to assume that the standard deviations of the population are not the same. So we would, while the formula looks the same, the degrees of freedom is calculated differently. But this is not this is not what we're going to use in our tests. And here are the rejection regions when sigma one and sigma two are known. So we're using Z. And if it's a one-tail test, so then the area of the rejection region would be alpha. If it's a one-tail, upper-tail test, it would be alpha as well. But if it's a two-tail test, we must divide alpha equally between the two tails, all right? And figure out what the corresponding uh, critical values are. And we can get that from the Z table easily, okay? So if alpha was 2.5% uh, or 0 0.025, then this is 1.96, negative 1.96. If alpha is 5%, then this is actually 1.645, or negative 1.645. And here we have an example actually given to us using those two things. I, I'll let you go through that. Finally, I want to just talk quickly about the paired samples case. With uh, paired samples, because we have uh, repeated measures, and two values in the sample are actually directly connected. And we want to check if there's a difference between one case or one, one, one sample and the other, or one population and the other. Then it makes sense to subtract the two values that are paired. So, for example, if we're testing whether or not a new training methodology improves my performance, I could perform or do the exam or test or whatever it is before the training and that gives me a score then if I repeat that after the training I get another score well the difference between those two will tell you whether or not the training helped me so if I got a 56 uh, on the exam before the training and I got a 90 on the exam after training that difference right is an, es is an estimate of what the difference in um, uh, in the before and after case is. So we take essentially the two sets of values that are paired and we subtract one from the other and we will get a sample of the one, 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 one single value that is a point, a uh, single value that is an estimate of a difference. And so if we take that for the entire sample, then we will get individual differences and we could average that, and that should give us an average or a sample mean for the difference between those two uh, population values. So you see here, we will calculate all of the differences. And the nice thing is that those two samples have to, will be exactly the same size because each individual is giving you a repeated measure. So if there are 10 people, you're going to have 20 values. Each person is going to give you two. All right, so you could you could take the before and after scores and subtract them from each other. When you add them all up and divide by n, you get the average of those differences. Now, in the formula sheet I gave you, I'm using x bar d, but um, here the example uses d bar. But don't get confused over it. This is the same as x bar d. And then when we use all of the differences, we could calculate the standard deviation. Now, this is the long formula, but you may recall the shortcut formula that I gave you which is something like this. Shortcut formula would be uh, SD is equal to the square root of sum of D squared, sum of D all squared over N divided by N minus one. So this is basically the same formula that we used before, except that instead of D, we had X, all right? Uh, this, this sort of formula right here. We had sum of X squared as a sum of X all squared over N divided by N minus 1, okay? And that is the shortcut formula. So if you look at this, you see exactly the same thing. Uh, but instead, here we go, 
this is the same as that. This here is the same as this. So there's really no difference between those two. So now that we have uh, x bar d, and we said uh, x bar d would just simply be x bar d would simply be the sum of the differences divided by the sample size. All right. So we have x bar d, and then we could do things like a confidence interval, plus or minus t s d over the square root of n, or we could get a test statistic x bar d minus mu d, which is the mean of population mean of the differences, s d over the square root of n, and your degrees of freedom is n minus 1. All right? So uh, we see here that's basically just repeating a single sample problem. And that's one of the, the nice things about this, is that essentially boils down to a single sample problem. All right? I think um, that pretty much covers, and all the same things apply in terms of the um, ways in which we state the hypotheses. One tail versus two tail tests, and so forth. And then we have an example given to us in our text. Right? So that is a case for difference between two means and two proportions. All right. Sorry, not proportion. We know we haven't touched proportions yet, but just uh, two means. So we're going to stop with this, and then I'm going to continue with um, difference between population proportions.